Hello and welcome to this Fain Productions event of A Night In with the Secret Barrister and Harriet Johnson, presented by me, Sarah Langford. And we will be talking tonight about these two magnificent books, uh, Harriet Johnson's book Enough, which is already out in a good bookshop near you, and Nothing But The Truth, which is the Secret Barrister's third book and is out today, the 12th of May. Uh, now, this is how it's going to work. I've got an easy guest who is Harriet, and I'm going to talk to her and ask her questions. She's going to answer them. But the secret barrister still hasn't found a rabbit that can talk. And so for their answers, uh, they will be anonymized and put into a scrambled voice. So you will be able to hear what they say without uncovering the mystery behind the secret barrister. Uh, let me just start a bit at the beginning by talking about these two books. Harriet Johnson's book, Enough, The Violence Against Women and How to End, End It, has been called by no less than Helena Kennedy QC, a brilliant forensic exposure of why women cannot get justice. And it's really a fact-packed fact whistle-stop through multiple areas in the law that fail uh, women, both with packed with statistics, but also Harriet's analysis. And I'll be talking to her about that analysis a bit later on. Uh, Nothing But The Truth is, of course, The Secret Barrister's third book, although it is quite different from their other books. And I will be asking them a bit about that. It's much more personal and anecdotal. And it really is a how it all began book. So maybe I can start with a question that is linked to that. Um, SB, at the beginning of this book, you describe just how many barristers tried to stop you being a barrister uh, all the way through, including your um, pupil master, who you affectionately describe as rhinocerine, although he sounds quite a character, you sound like you grew quite fond of him in the end but he was desperate as others were to put you off going to the criminal bar now this is exactly the same experience i had and i'll ask harriet about her experience in a minute but maybe it was the same but why do you think this is is it that they like um you in the process of this book realize the chasm between a perception of the law and the reality of the law or do you just think we're all really a bunch of moaners. Let me make one thing clear at the outset. There is no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that criminal barristers are gold standard moaners. We are dyed in the wool pessimists, and the very first thing we will do after giving a perfect speech or conducting a perfect cross-examination is sit down and list all the ways in which it was terrible. We are cynical malcontents, and nothing I can say that follows is intended to distract from that inalienable truth. However, I think that something that does hit you fairly quickly and violently after you start criminal practice is that chasm that you describe. Of course, to an extent, there's a chasm between expectation and practice in every area of practice at the bar. Nothing can truly prepare you for the leap you are expected to take between your vocational studies and actually doing the job. But criminal law carries its own additional pressures, not only because the job is inherently difficult, but because the conditions that surround it, conditions that are deliberately engineered by those responsible for our justice system, make it so much harder. Whether it's the chaos of criminal court listings making it impossible to arrange your family or social life, or the below minimum wage pay that awaits many juniors on completing pupillage, there's a very strong feeling, and for me it gets stronger the longer I do this job, that it is unnecessarily hard. And it's the frustration at that lack of necessity, at the fact that it doesn't have to be like this, that I think really grinds people down. And while I'm not one of those who tells aspiring criminal barristers don't do crime, I think we owe it to future generations to be honest about what awaits them. Because as a philosopher once said, it's not like it says in the brochure. Harriet, what about you? Did anyone ever 
tell you not to become a barrister will you tell us a bit about your journey to the bar and how you came to be here and um, so I I think I'm a bit different to a lot of people who set out wanting to be barristers I didn't know any barristers growing up I'd never met one as far as I know um I was one of those awful sanctimonious 18 year olds who went off to university deciding they were going to change the world but just wasn't quite sure how to do it um and then in my second year at university I was working in a pub it was a beautiful pub in the countryside full of Tories and uh, one of the locals was a barrister and obviously being at university I was about as left-wing as it was possible for a human being to be at that point and he and I would always have big arguments about politics and all sorts of things um, and one day I said to him what's it like being a barrister and he said why don't you come and find out so I spent a week shadowing uh, in a criminal court the most um maybe the most compelling trial you could possibly watch as a civilian. It was a, a man who'd been involved in a bar fight. Um, his friend had got into a fight with somebody else and then that man's friend had started on him. He would pinned him up against the bar, I remember, and um, our, well, this barrister's client, I always think of him as mine still, um, had in the spur of the moment reached out for the nearest thing that he could find, grabbed what happened to be a pint glass and hit his assailant to the side of the face with it, causing him some quite serious injuries. Um, he was charged with causing grievous bodily harm with intent. He'd never been in trouble before in his life. His wife was very, very, very shortly due to give birth um, and was sitting there incredibly heavily pregnant in the public gallery. And he worked for a company that supplied um, or worked, worked for the RAF, I think. So if he got a criminal conviction, he lost his job as well as you know, impending potential prison sentence. So stakes could not have been higher, he could not have been nicer, and it could not have been a, a more tense um, case of feeling such strong empathy for this very nice man who'd been in a situation that I think so many people could find themselves in so easily. Um, and it was just, it was intoxicating. It was, you know, if you could apply the movie version of Love at First Sight with, strings and soft lighting to a job um it was that I immediately wanted not just to to train to do it I wanted to have a go right then and there which happily um we're not allowed to do but it was from then on really I thought well maybe maybe that's how I can try to put into practice this ridiculously sanctimonious desire to try and help people is by showing off in court in a ridiculous costume I love that. I love, there's nothing like kicking off with a good glassing to get you interested in the criminal law. I yeah. also love how pubs were hugely instrumental to both of our journeys because I got a job in a pub to meet barristers because <laughs> I also didn't know any. So they clearly, you know, we've now learned that that is mostly where barristers hang out. So it's actually quite a good tactical plan. But Yeah, very good for any prospective students or future barristers watching this, just go to the pub. Exactly. Yeah. It sounds like he was quite encouraging, though. So you never had anyone saying what I had, which is the criminal bar is going to be dead in 10 years. It will all be in house. There won't be a criminal bar. Don't don't bother. Don't even come in, into it. I did have that as well. Um, but being quite belligerent, I um, wasn't especially put off by it. But I, I remember that came later. So I remember at bar school um, having a, a talk from a, a very senior um, which is a polite way of saying great old um, white male barrister who said, you know, don't do crime. He said this to an auditorium full of students, don't do crime. Um, you know, you might as well be a solicitor as do crime as if those two were equally dreadful fates. Um, and he said, you, you know, you can't make a living. And I put my hand up and said, you know, brass tacks, <laughs> what do you mean make a living? And his response at the time was, if you want to send your children to private school and take them skiing, you can't do it as a criminal barrister. And I remember thinking, I'm I'm not sure that's the poverty line. <laughs> um, it just shows the gap, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And I think a lot of people in that room sort of were quite enlightened by that because he was that was the first time I certainly had heard somebody express it in those terms. And I did quite a lot of research then to find out what the situation was. But of course, that was uh, 2009, 2010, I was training. And of course, the situation's got a lot worse since then. And during the course of my career, I've certainly had people try to put me off crime or try to, me encourage, try to encourage me to do what I have in fact done, which is branch out into other areas as well to support it. Yeah, 
which is exactly what I did. And yeah, we'll talk about retention maybe a bit later on, but the chasm between practice as it was when legal aid was, was healthy. And I think SB talks about this in one of their other books. There was a period of time where there was the cream of it. And because of that, this, everybody is now suffering the consequences, including the clients and the people within the court system. Um, but it seems like, SB, this is a question I wanted to ask you, both of you really, despite this and despite the uh, efforts by barristers, including um, SB, to try and kind of crack the mirage, it feels like the enthusiasm amongst university graduates and young people to go to the bar is still pretty strong. And I think admissions reflect that. Mm. For those students who get in touch with you, do you, is that borne out? Or do you think there is actually a sharp decline in the number of people wanting to go to the bar? Or maybe there are different people wanting to go to the bar. I don't know, Espy, what do you think about where the future of the bar lies and who's coming into it? As far as I can tell, there remains a lot of enthusiasm. One of the nicest parts of what I do is when a law student gets in touch to say they have read my books and have been motivated to pursue criminal law. I can't say it's the effect that I was expecting to create with my doom memoirs, but it's wonderful to hear. I recognise, however, that it's possible that my sample is skewed. I speak to law lecturers and tutors who report a reduction in students expressing a desire to practice publicly funded crime, which is a real worry. I think that there is still a perception that the brightest and best head for the bright lights of commercial and chancery pupillages, and I think that's dangerous. Even if the government thinks that criminal lawyers are worth one twentieth of their commercial counterparts, I still believe that defending and prosecuting criminal cases remains one of the most important functions that the English and Welsh Bar performs, and I think it's crucial not to lose that message. SB, the students listening to that, the enthusiastic ones that you've just referred to, all want to know, I imagine, what it really takes to be a barrister. <laughs> And in your book, the art of bluff features quite heavily, <laughs> both in terms of your own anecdotes and watching others in court. Is that what it takes? Yes, next. Or to answer slightly more fully, possibly, but it shouldn't. One of the unfortunate realities about the bar is that it holds an attraction for a certain type of person who thinks that supreme confidence and a loud voice are a substitute for ability. We all meet these people at law school and at bar school, the three piece suit wankers, as I call them in my book, and many of them are fortunately weeded out at that stage, but some slip through the net, and then we meet them in court. I think we can all summon to mind people we have been against in court whose self belief far exceeds their abilities. And unfortunately, that raw egotism can be enough for some people to get by. The comfort that I try to take is that most people, certainly most judges, can see through it. And I like to think that there is greater nobility in being one of average ability and acknowledging your fallibility than in believing yourself to be infallible. Harriet, I may be gender stereotyping horribly here, but I haven't met many female three-piece suit wankers. I don't know if you're, because of course your book is focused um, mostly on women defendants and how they're let down by the system, but there is something of the attrition rate of women lawyers and how poorly women represented in the police and how at a senior level, women are still not equally represented at the bar. Do you think that these two play into each other, the bluff, the bluff that SB is talking about, and how, whether that's off-putting and really has any kind of place in the courtroom now? That's a magnificently leading question, but... <laughs> I'll do my best not to be led, but I mean, for what it's worth, I think I think that's absolutely right. I think one of the themes that comes up again and again in my book is about culture 
and how culture isn't necessarily automatically improved by having more women in any organization certainly when it comes to um to unfairness to women um but it's certainly a step in the right direction and i certainly think that um the bar would be tremendously improved by having equal numbers of men and women at every level because as you pointed out the the entry level statistics are pretty good but it's when you get to about my call about sort of 11 12 years call that you start to see the drop off rate um and it's difficult to say why that is there are lots of theories about it it may well be that women have more self respect than their male counterparts and after after 12 years start to think i'm not doing this to myself anymore for the reasons that sb so brilliantly sets out in their book it is in many ways a thankless job and there does come a point i think for most barristers sometimes it comes often and comes back and then leaves again where you start to think surely I'm worth more than this but I do think um I, I do think it's improving I think certainly the women who I see on the bench are almost without exception so keen to offer a hand up to other women barristers and I see more and more um events more and more mentoring schemes aimed at, at bringing bringing women up and supporting women which is a really great thing but I also think having you know I've talked a lot about marginalized communities in the book as well because of course when we talk about women we're not just talking about you know women like me who sound like me and have the same skin color as me we're talking about women from a whole range of backgrounds and if you're unfortunate enough to be a woman from a marginalized background, that compound unfairness is a real problem. It's a real problem when it comes to women who are being represented in court, either as complainants or as defendants, but it's also a real problem at the bar. But I do think, I mean, I, I'm mindful of a, a case where I was, um, I was co-defending in uh, a London Crown Court, which will remain nameless, um, being prosecuted by a very, very nice man. And the woman I was co-defending with uh, was also very nice, but also a woman. Um, and on one particular day, the, our prosecutor asked if we could uh, make sure that we rose at half past four. Um, so for anybody who's not familiar with normal court sitting times, it's usually in theory a four or 4.30 enter the court day to allow us enough time to prepare for the next day. Um, but we had routinely been sitting late so our prosecutor asked if we could um, if we could make sure that we left at or that we rose at half past four so that he could uh, collect his children. And our judge, um, without blinking, said, can't your wife do it? Um, and of course, my co-defending barrister and I were both immediately on our feet before I think either of us knew what we were going to say. We were just both immediately outraged by this suggestion that his wife should um, take up childcare, not least because actually the man in question is gay. So it was a, a terrible question in so many ways. But I think that camaraderie is certainly something that you do see at the bar. And I think having more women, bearing in mind that we are 51 odd percent of the population, um, so just in numbers, in terms of marginalised groups, there are more of us than there are of other marginalised groups. Having more women, I think, also leads to a fairer bar, a more representative bar and a more understanding bar um, that is better at taking care of other marginalised groups as well. Of course, I'm generalising hugely, but I do think I do think more women in higher positions would be a very good thing. Well, that is the most perfect example of how equality and diversity Ha is beneficial for everybody across the board because I haven't I, I haven't been in practice since I had my children which is I'm feed directly into the attrition rate statistics but in the decade I was I never heard a man asked to go home early to pick up his children once and I don't think that many felt I may be assuming too much here but they could have done that mm. it would have been a surprising request and the fact that it isn't now even if that judge thought it was yeah and is supported but changes their lives as well mm. and uh, that's a beautiful example of how it kind of affects waves across the bar um sb i wanted to ask you a bit about the the heart of both of these two books which whilst quite different in style have something very similar in common which is a gap between kind of perception and reality and you 
uh, are really the cipher for us, the reader, in your book, because whilst Harriet tackles the mainstream perception reality, what people outside the bar think of it, you talk about your own prejudices before you came to the bar and what you thought the bar was going to be about. And a lot of them were informed by your reading material, your choice of newspapers. But now that you're in it and those, those assumptions have fallen away um, a lot, who do you think are the main culprits for misinformation about the bar. I mean, you're quite clear in that you talk about that a complete lack of education at school about the legal system, and you are firmly uh, hold the, the Mail and Telegraph responsible for what you thought criminal bar was for, what it should do, what, it, what its purpose was. The tabloid press is the obvious pantomime villain with its inaccurate nonsense about cushy prisons and fat cat legal aid lawyers and soft, loopy judges. Nonsense which I, for a long time, assumed to be true. When you add into the mix posturing populist politicians looking to style themselves as tough on crime by encouraging and repeating these myths, you have an endless cyclical orgy of misinformation. But the roots of the problem spread much deeper and much wider. And some of the blame, a large part, I feel, lies with us, the legal profession. Because historically, we have done far too little to explain what we do to the public and to show why it matters. We have jealously guarded the secrets of the justice system and paid scant regard to the need to ensure that the public understand why things work in the way they do. I also think that, for all our moaning in roving rooms, we have been useless at telling the public about the real problems that we encounter in our justice system. Harriet, you do not shy away at all from spelling out in clear and urgent prose what the real problems in our justice system are when it comes to women. And whilst the book is filled with statistics and stories about a range of problems, it feels like uh, the case of Sarah Everard and her murder shadows over the book uh, quite a lot. It begins with it and you refer back to it. Can you tell us something about the reality of what you call the dark alley myth and stranger killing and what's your interpretation of why Sarah Everard's tragic murder had such a big response and seemed to mean so much to so many women in the public? So I think, I mean, first of all, starting off with the myths, when we imagine a woman being attacked. I think so many of us go straight to that dark alley myth of, you know, a woman walking alone at night in the dark alley being attacked by a stranger. Um, and the, the myth, the really powerful myth about that is that women are far more likely to be, well, far more likely to be raped by men they know, by men they're in a relationship with or have been in a relationship with women are far more likely to be murdered by men they are in a relationship with or have been in a relationship with. That's, that's the biggest category of risk for women is men with whom we're in a relationship. That, that reality is terrifying. Um, and it's troubling, I think. The reality that you can be in a, a loving, happy relationship with somebody who makes you feel really special and that that relationship can deteriorate over time to one of abuse, to one potentially involving rape and to one ultimately involving murder is horrific. And I think if women had that at the forefront of their minds all the time, we would, you know, women would never get into relationships with men. Um, so I think it's, it's partly because it's so deeply uncomfortable to acknowledge that. It's so deeply uncomfortable to, you know, look at the person you're in a relationship with, the person you're sharing a house with, the person you're marrying, 
and know that statistically he is the biggest danger to your life. And but that I, is, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but the statistics are really powerful. So I think it's worth repeating them, which is, as you say, two women a week uh, uh, are murdered by a man or a man um, murders two women a week. And what I, a statistic I didn't know, which was that over 70% of women who are murdered are murdered in their own homes, which is a yeah. hugely powerful statistic. Yeah. So in terms of the actual statistics just on murder, 93% of murders are committed by men. So while men are more likely statistically to be victims of murder, they're also incredibly overwhelmingly more likely to be the people who commit murder. An average of two women a week are killed, not just by a man, but by a partner or ex-partner. So that's that's what we're looking at. That's where the um, relationship factor comes in. 62% um, of women who are killed, so I say killed because that includes manslaughter, um, they die at the hands of a partner or an ex-partner. Um, and for older women, the second most likely category is that they'll be killed by their own son. So the st statistics are terrifying. And like you say, far more likely to happen in your home or in the home of the partner. Um, the dark alley myth, I think it persists partly because, like I said, it's more comfortable, but also partly I think there are, we can you know, blame the pantomime villain of the media again. Um, although in this case, I think they're behaving quite responsibly, which is that in certainly in, in cases of rape and serious sexual assault or any sexual assault, complainants, so people who make the allegation, regardless of whether or not the person is convicted, um, have lifetime anonymity. So that includes not just having um, your name printed in the paper, but the newspapers, any publishers can't publish anything that might potentially identify you. So what we often refer to as a jigsaw identification. So if you bear in mind the fact that you're far more likely to be raped by your boyfriend or ex-boyfriend or husband or ex-husband, if a newspaper prints that a person was convicted of raping his ex-wife, then for anybody who knows that person, it runs a very serious risk of, of identifying the victim. And so the, the rapes and the serious sexual assaults that we read about in newspapers tend to be those stranger rapes, those a woman was attacked by somebody she'd never met rapes. Um, because it's much safer ground, but I think that does that does skew our perspective as to um, what the statistics actually show us. But there's no doubt that the voices that rang out during the aftermath of Sarah Everett's murder were extremely powerful and appeared to be heard. And you give a really interesting statistic about how, in a survey, half of all men who responded said they would change their behavior as part of the murder how they behaved when walking down the street and so on do you think it was a moment of real change do you think that that is going to have a ripple effect which is more than um uh, impact on the rape statistics that how men in behave towards women when out in public i hope so i would really like to think so there are, I mean, there are also statistics that go alongside that that are potentially more troubling. So um, in the aftermath of Sarah Everard's murder, thousands of men signed up to one particular online course called Exploring Masculinities and Allyship Training for Men, and around 90% of them didn't show up. So there's a zeitgeist problem, I think. And I'm not, you know, I'm not seeking to point the finger at men because, you know, hashtag not all men. But it is also true that the vast majority of men would never dream of behaving like this. But there's a difference between not doing it yourself and not actively taking steps to make your behaviour better and to make the behaviour of those around you better. And I think the latter is what we really need from men now. And I, I'm, I think it might well be that culture now is so instant that we we have these moments and then we move on to something else and forget about it. Um, and that certainly is something that we need to grapple with as a society in general, but also that men need to be consistent in their response to is to not just having that short term will to do something, but following through on it. That is um, the thing, the action that men really need to take, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And also the responsibility on, uh, we've already talked about the press, but other portrayals, I guess, of rape, sexual assault, and what it means. And a really good example, one I wanted to ask SBA about, because of course, as a prosecutor and defender, they will have done 
um, these kinds of offences. Uh, I wanted to ask SB if they watched the Sarah Vaughan adaptation of Anatomy of a Scandal, which deals with a very um, a, a grey area in rape, not in terms of um, whether it's rape or not, but in public perception of rape and teasing out some of the difficulties that in the courtroom, especially in a rape case, especially when it's one person's word against another, which is a situation that you talk about, Harriet, in your book, uh, we've all seen how that plays out. And I just wanted to ask Esme what they thought about the adaptations and um, how it dealt with it. As Harriet says, I think that many of us still struggle with the dark alley myth when, as we know, the vast majority of rape and sexual abuse is anything but. To that extent, I found Anatomy of a Scandal a really interesting exercise in exposing those myths and focusing on the exploitation of power that lies at the heart of most, if not all, sexual offending. It also demonstrated the difficulties in prosecuting such cases where it is usually the word of the complainant against the defendant. Often, I suspect that the jury is pretty sure where the truth lies, but pretty sure isn't the requisite standard. I adored the book, although I did think it was disappointing that the court scenes in the adaptation reinforced some of the other myths that the public had told around how complainants in these cases are treated. Dramatic license may prefer that a rape complainant appears in court with no screens and no support to be examined by barristers over several days. But the reality is that, for all its faults, the system has made significant changes to improve the experience for witnesses. So, for instance, in a complaint of rape, a complainant will be interviewed by trained police officers shortly after reporting the allegation, and a recording of that interview will be played as the witness's evidence in chief. Any questioning about sexual history has to be approved by a judge following legal argument between the parties. I don't think anybody is helped when TV studios forsake accuracy. Well, quite, SB. Um, but anyone who has become a barrister, thanks to Kavanaugh QC, of which there are actually a surprising number, based on what people say to me, know that these TV shows can be really influential in terms of teaching the public, not just about the law, but inspiring people to go into it. What do you think have been the best screen representations of court reality? And which are the ones that want to make you throw a gavel at the telly? Defending the guilty was very true to life. Silk had its moments, although the pupil stealing his wig and then conducting cases in court during his first six made me weep. Soaps, Coronation Street in particular, have long been appalling at even pretending they care about accuracy. Sorry, Corrie, but it's true. Three months for a Crown Court trial to be listed in your dreams, pal. Harry, what's your answer to that? Do you have any views on how the law is being portrayed on screen? So I, uh, since coming to the bar, have um, have found it quite difficult to watch legal dramas for exactly the reason you set out. It makes me want to throw stuff at the TV, though not gavels. Um, I am one of those people who loved Kavanagh and who, and not growing up, but when I decided I wanted to be a barrister, I, um, I was working on death row for a while and the whole process was, as you'd imagine, enormously emotionally taxing. So I took the box set, I had the DVD box set of Kavanagh QC with me and used to watch that in the evenings to remind myself why I was doing it and that this was, you know, this was an important fight for justice and not just a really dreadful thing that wears you down. But I would say about Silk, I agree with SB, the thing I think they get right is the relationships between barristers and clerks and that complex relationship where on the one hand technically barristers employ clerks so technically clerks work for barristers and anybody else would think that that's a fairly straightforward relationship but at the same time because clerks decide what goes in and comes out of your diary they essentially manage your entire career so the power balance there was really well done I think um, but also that closeness that you can have and that tension between the closeness that you can have personally and their sometimes conflicting 
um, commitments to chambers, to your personal practice, and of course, to making their own lives easier by managing diaries. Um, but the point I wanted to make as well about legal dramas is a grossly underrated one. And I know SB shares my opinion on this because they did a, a live tweet along to it, which was excellent. Um, is Legally Blonde is so grossly underrated. And I know, of course, we're dealing with a white woman who is so wealthy that she's able to decide on a whim to go to Harvard Law School and just ask her parents for the money. So we have to acknowledge at first that tremendous privilege. But there's an important message there, which is about not needing to be a stereotypical lawyer to be good at law or to be a good lawyer. And in particular, one scene where Warner effectively seeks to argue that a sperm is the same as a child in, um, in one of their law lectures. And she, her takedown of him, and particularly her takedown of that argument, is so perfect. It's a textbook example of reductio ad absurdum. That's the only Latin I know, and it's only because I did a philosophy degree. But it's also, it's just so beautifully structured. It's such a beautiful piece of advocacy that really, I think it's grossly underappreciated. And every time I tell people that I love Legally Blonde, they make all the jokes that you would imagine. But there's a lot to it. And that's a very good argument. Um, so that's my recommendation is watch Kavanagh by all means bear in mind that he is in a unique position amongst barristers as far as I can tell in that he is always on the right side in his cases he yeah. is never he is never acting for the baddie uh, which a lot of us do of course because even baddies should have a fair trial um, but Legally Blonde's a good place to look if you want real textbook logical brilliant advocacy it's a good place to start that brings me nicely on to the bit I wanted to talk about, which is something that when you talk to people outside of the criminal law, they can't really believe that it actually happens, which is how cases are listed. And particularly the mess that it's become over the last kind of five or so years. You both tackle this concept, which we inelegantly call floaters or returns, and the impact that those two have on everybody who is caught up in the court system. SB, can you start by explaining what they are, why they're critical to the justice system, and why they, despite what was reported otherwise, was, were targeted in the recent strike? Criminal court listings are pure chaos. Criminal trials overrun sometimes by weeks or even months. Cases which are listed for trial often get adjourned on the day because there just aren't enough courtrooms or judges or barristers. Shorter hearings often can't go ahead because the court forgets to book an interpreter or the prison doesn't bother to bring a defendant to court. And the courts will often simply list a case for a hearing without asking whether the barristers involved are available. We travel all over the country for our cases, so our diaries are forever in flux, and we can't guarantee our whereabouts from one day to the next. In order to stop the courts grinding to a halt overnight, we have traditionally covered each other's cases, what is known as a return. This can be a stressful business. It means picking up a case, even a complicated trial, at a few hours' notice and having to completely absorb it and present it as if it were our own. We do it for no thanks and no reward. There's no emergency barrister premium like you'd pay for an out of hours plumber. And for now, we've decided we don't want to do this anymore. We have done it as an act of goodwill and that goodwill has been thrown back in our faces by the government who, having commissioned an independent report into criminal legal aid, and now refusing to follow its recommendations. So it's not a strike. We will keep doing our own cases, keep working around the clock on those, but we won't be helping the system out by covering other people's cases. Harriet, what problems do you think, or have you seen, uh, a cause specifically for women caught up in the justice system by this kind of extremely last minute uh, return or floating system, I know they're completely different, a floater is where it will go in if there's a gap and so you get very short notice. Um, can you tell us a little bit about 
how you think this impacts women within the system? So um, one point to make before we start on that about about the backlog um, and about the the delay, the delays currently operating in, in the criminal justice system is that it's consistently um, attempted by the government and particularly by uh, Dominic Rubb to call it a COVID delay. Now it's right that the, the backlog of criminal cases which results in this delay in trials being heard um, has been impacted by COVID, but on the 31st of March, 2019, so just as the pandemic was starting, the number of cases waiting to be tried in the Crown Court was already 33,290. The most recent figures we have from June 2021 show it's now at about 60,000. I expect it'll be worse now. Um, so it, it increased by about 71%, but that figure, 33,290 cases waiting to be tried in the Crown Court is significant and is a, as a direct result, I think, of courts being closed uh, and other cuts to the criminal justice system that have made it impossible for it to operate properly. What's interesting in terms of how this particularly impacts women is that there was a report by the National Audit Office which found that rape and serious sexual assault offences, which do affect men, it's really important to emphasise that, but overwhelmingly statistically affect women. Those are the cases that have been most acutely affected by the backlog. Um, partly, I think, as a result of the fact that, again, statistically, people accused of those offences are less likely to plead guilty than those in other cases. So we now see cases where complainants um, in rape and serious sexual assault cases are waiting years um, for their trial to come to court. And that's a tremendous amount of stress for those people involved, not knowing what the outcome is going to be, uh, not knowing what's going to happen in their case and waiting to have to give evidence. A lot of women, perfectly understandably, feel like they can't carry on with their lives while they, while they still have that hanging over them. And so ultimately withdraw their support for the prosecution. Um, so when we talk about women withdrawing support for a prosecution, very often, as SB's pointed out, because so often in these cases, because of the nature of the offence, it is one person's word against another, although that's absolutely not a bar to a successful prosecution. But so often because that prosecution is dependent entirely on the word of one person, if that person says, I'm not coming to court to give evidence, then those prosecutions inevitably fail. And the people accused of committing these incredibly serious crimes um, have the cases against them discontinued. This is um, a bit of a pivot, but it's still really, it's still critical to your book, which is that the police get a hammering in your book. <laughs> I'm very fair. <laughs> well, I mean, you do quotes, so it's not like you're making it up. It's what they said. And you take things from text messages, take quotes from text messages, and you are very clear about uh, an, in an inherent misogyny that runs throughout the force. I mean, you, you say it very boldly, Cousins, the, mur the man, the police officer who murdered Sarah Ever Everard, was not an anomaly. Can you tell us, give us a bit more of the flavour about, maybe some more personal stories about how you've seen this manifest, uh, maybe the, the heartbreaking story that you tell us in the book of Kira. Mm. So I, I should say, in defence of myself and also in defence of police officers, I do say in the book, um, it's, it is an impossibly hard job. And I know that you, Sarah, and you, SB, will both have, as I have, worked with incredible police officers who join the police for utterly selfless reasons, who are not especially well remunerated, who um, have antisocial hours and also have to do a job that puts them fully and squarely in danger every single day that they go to work. And it's I freely admit in the book and again here that it's a job I would not want to do. I have tremendous respect and admiration for those that do want to do it and for those that do it well. But I think those good officers are being as let down as the rest of us are by the culture of misogyny within the police, if not more so, because in the same way as, um, well, I suppose it's, it's, it's the bad apple problem, isn't it? Is that um, the, the damage to the police reputation and the damage to the reputation of those good officers 
must be so hurtful for them as much as it's infuriating to us when we read the news stories that have come out in the last particularly in the last two years since Sarah Everard's death um forgive me in the last year since Sarah Everard's death um but that have been coming out so consistently so for example you know we've we know of the cases of uh, the two officers who entered the uh, crime scene where the bodies of Nicole Smallman and Bieber Henry were being um, sheltered. Their job was to protect the crime scene. And they not only violated the crime scene, which led to the defendant later arguing at his trial that certain evidence shouldn't be relied on because it was contaminated by these officers, um, but also violated the basic dignity of these two murdered women by taking their photographs and sending them to text by text message via WhatsApp to, amongst other people, a group that contained 41 other police officers. That abhorrent disrespect for human life and the openness with which they did it, I think shocked a lot of people and shows also the intersection that we've talked about of, of racism and misogyny that is so often a feature of these problems that we see with police officers. And then we had things like the Charing Cross text messages where, uh, which came out in January this year, where police officers were openly joking to each other about rape, about sexual assault. They're also making homophobic and racist um, jokes to each other and, and using language that was so far beyond unacceptable to each other. The thing that was most alarming to me about this and the thing that's most alarming to me about it when it comes up in my cases. So to give you an example from one of my own cases that I've cited in the book, it's when police officers email each other. So in writing, and in, in one particular case, a police officer um, emailed another saying, rape is plainly bollocks and would never see a courtroom. Um, and I, based on short, purely their own judgment of, what they thought of the victim. The problem is not just the attitudes. The attitudes are bad enough, but I think the extent of the problem is really shown by the fact that police officers are willing to put these things in writing, to put them on record, to send photographs to other people saying, look, I've just been in a crime scene, taking the piss out of two dead women, to say to each other in writing on WhatsApp messages, you know, you how is rape, um, like I can't even remember what it was but some terrible joke about credit cards and knives and using them to spread butter or get women into bed openly not even joking about but advocating beating their girlfriends and saying how women are genetically programmed to like it putting these things writing putting these things on email in whatsapp sending each other photographs that is not something you do I would suggest unless you're confident of the culture that you operate in. Having those attitudes, but feeling you need to hide them would perhaps be an indicator of a bad apple, of an occasional wrong and as Cressida Dick famously described cousins. Feeling confident enough to put them in writing is I would suggest indicative of a culture of misogyny and the culture that tolerates misogyny because you only do that I think if you know that there aren't going to be consequences if you're comfortable enough to put it in writing knowing that nothing will come of it and that I think has been what's so shocking about police culture I'm not saying for a moment that misogyny doesn't exist in other parts of the criminal justice system because of course um, the criminal justice system is run and staffed by um, human beings and we know objectively that we live in an inherently um, unfair society when it comes to treatment of women, treatment of people of colour, treatment of disabled people, treatment of trans people, treatment of people um, from, from poor socioeconomic, socioeconomic backgrounds. All of these people have a hard time and of course that's reflected in the criminal justice system and that's a huge problem that I think the criminal justice system more generally needs to work on because as I've said in the book I think we need to be held to a higher standard than society we're drawn from, not a lower one. But I think the indicator of the extent of the problem is that they feel comfortable enough to put it in writing and to expect that there will be zero consequences of that. That's what's so alarming to me about the police in particular. Yeah, 
that's a really powerful point. You only say that, especially in a form that means it can be shown to you afterwards. If you think the person who's done it to you will agree with it. Yeah. And of course, all of us who work in a system which deals with tragedy and uh, people who in, may in any other circumstances be at their best, we always see people at their worst, there is a hardening that comes with that exposure for all of us yeah. who are within it. But I know I wanted just to ask SB what they thought about that, because I know they've been very open about prosecuting and defending. So we'll have seen, and I do think that if you, detend, if you tend to defend, you sometimes can get a skewed view of the police because of course you only see them in circumstances which haven't been resolved, which was absolutely predominantly yeah. my experience. But prosecuting brings you of course much closer to the police and you see them at different angles. And um, I just wanted to ask you what you thought having read Harriet's book about, um, about whether this is a real culture problem that needs a deep, needs tackling on a kind of deeper level. Fortunately, I don't encounter those attitudes as frequently as Harriet does. While I have prosecuted police officers for misconduct in public office in cases involving overtly misogynistic behaviour, I read parts of enough with my mouth open. I think my innocence is due in part to the nature of my practice. Harriet mentions that her data sample is slightly skewed as the cases that land on her desk tend to be those where something has gone badly wrong. I'm generally at the other end of the spectrum. Much of my prosecution work is rassy, rape and serious sexual offences, and generally the officers I work with are well trained, and these are cases in which the police have, largely, investigated reasonably well. There are problems in the way such cases are investigated and prosecuted, of course, but these by definition tend not to be the cases where institutional bias has resulted in complaints not being investigated, or complaints being summarily disbelieved. I would urge anyone who prosecutes or defends in these cases to read enough. It is grimly eye-opening. Can I um, add to that? First yeah. of all, thank you, SB. I will find out who you are one day and repay you later. Um, but also, back to the skewed data sample, it's it's something that I've, I've mentioned in the book and I want to be really clear about here, is that cases don't land on my desk where everything's gone right and police officers have properly supported a victim throughout the trial process. And, um, you know, they've done a really thorough and good investigation. I only, by definition, see the cases where something's gone really wrong. But I think the the data shows us, and it's backed up by my own experience in practice, that the failings are so grievous and so alarming and so often so similar that we really need to, as a society, be concerned about what's happening. I think the statistic that shows that the most is the 1.6% the statistic, which is that as things stand, the latest numbers we have, 1.6% of rapes reported to the police result in a prosecution. That's not even in a conviction, that's in a prosecution. So another way of putting that is 98.4% of um, alleged rapists don't face any consequence for what they've allegedly done. Now, um, I've referred to this in the book as well, that there's um, there are those who would seek to argue that 98.4% of cases must be false, must be made up for that reason. But there was an in-depth Home Office study um, done into precisely that matter that found that at most around 3% of rape allegations were likely to be false. So there is an alarming number of chiefly women um, who are being grossly let down by police, who I ought to add, are tremendously underfunded, tremendously under-resourced, and tremendously under-trained and struggling to cope with technology increasing faster than any of us can keep up um, against a background where they had a, a funding cut between 2010 and 2019. They suffered a real terms funding cut of around 30 percent. So they're having to do so much more, technologically speaking, so much more in terms of the care given to complainants and to witnesses. Um, with fewer people, less money, less resources, less training, and only 40% of police um, forces 
currently have specialist RASO units, so what SB referred to as rape and serious sexual assault, uh, serious sexual offences units. So only 40% of police forces have those special units. They don't have the money, they don't have the training, they don't have the personnel. So it's a real uh, institutional problem as well. Yeah, a huge battle. And of course, what's dangerous about those statistics, apart from the fact that you're dealing with a huge number of crimes that haven't been even got to the point of being um, prosecuted, is that it can create an impression that if you are raped, you'll never get to trial. And it's, yeah. I think Helena Kennedy talks about this in her book, that it it's dissuades women from even reporting them. Whereas you make very clear in, in your book, and I'm sure all of us here have had experience of this, that you can absolutely have a conviction on one person's word against another. And that ties- That's absolutely right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, it is, as SB sets out, it is a high bar um, and quite properly because a criminal conviction is such a serious thing. Um, so it's it's right that we expect the prosecution to prove a case so that a jury is sure before any criminal conviction can be can be found. But I certainly have been in court where I've heard victims in a whole range of cases giving evidence that has really shaken me and has really got through to my spine I'm sure um and you'll correct me if you want to I don't want to speak for you but I'm I'm sure that the two of you have had similar experiences and I think that's true of anybody in the courtroom it's not just about it's, it's not about quantity it's about quality and I certainly have heard people telling a story about what happened to them without tears without any of the drama that we've come to expect from Corrie um <laughs> in a way that has made me so absolutely sure that what they are saying happened and happened exactly how they say it is, that I can't see how a jury could reach any other conclusion. It is possible. Um, and with a skilled and, and careful prosecutor, it can be done very well and very um, very properly and very fairly. So I think that's a huge myth that, um, that we do need to dispel and that we need to dispel amongst the police, but also amongst the general public, that if you haven't got CCTV and DNA and three eyewitnesses and a recorded confession, there's no hope. That's absolutely not the case. Absolutely. And it's why we don't try cases by computer, <laughs> because there is something about <laughs> exactly the, about listening to a real story and juries um, are usually quite good at sniffing that out. Um, just before we move back to SB, I wanted to ask you, Harriet, what you hoped would be the consequence of writing this book? What, what's your hope for it? Whose hands do you hope it finds a way into? Um, I realise this, it may not be the <laughs> people that should read it, but there might be people who, as SB already said, read it with their mouth open. What's your hope for the book? Well, obviously, my immediate hope is that it becomes an international bestseller. I get to sell the rights to my life story, choose which beautiful 20 year old actress will pay me and um, retire to garden for the rest of my life. Um, very fair expectation. I think and realistic, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I mean, it's difficult to say. I. I've, I made reference in, in the book to the fact that some training on dealing with vulnerable witnesses is still voluntary for barristers. And the point I make there is that the people most likely to need that training are perhaps the people least likely to, to take it up. And I think the same might be true of a book about violence against women. Um, my, my best hope for it is that the people who read it can use it as a, a, a toolkit. The reason I've included the statistics in each section is because I want people who are faced with the myths to be able to dispel them. I want them to have those statistics at their fingertips so that when faced with myths and misconceptions about violence against women, there is a solid factual basis for dispelling them because that's the first part of the argument one. And I think the first thing we need to do is expose just how bad the reality is and particularly how bad the reality is for marginalised women, for women without power, for women whose voices aren't being heard on Newsnight or Women's Hour. Um, that's the first thing we need to do. Um, and after that, just a, a basic revolution where women rule the world fairly and benevolently and we will live happily ever after. Esme, can I ask the same question? 
uh, of you, what your hopes for the book was, with the caveat that this, um, this book, Nothing But The Truth, is slightly different to your other two. It is more intimate. It is laden with very funny anecdotes about your personal experiences and your journey to the bar. How has the writing of it been different from the other two, if at all? And what do you hope to achieve with Nothing But The Truth? In many ways, it was harder to write. There was less research, but a lot more introspection, and it wasn't always comfortable. At times, it was quite cathartic, exercising some old demons along the way. But I don't think that, as a profession, we're very good at pausing to examine a lot of the truths we treat as self-evident. I hope that it sheds a little light on people's understanding of justice. Something I noticed when I started studying law was the chasm between my law and order values and the values of many people working in criminal justice. One of the things I try to examine in the book is why there is that gap. What is it about exposure to criminal justice that changes a person, that changed me? SB, your anonymity has been a carefully guarded secret for a very long time successfully now when this has been threatened and I knew at the beginning there were some pretty dogged attempts by certain publications which I shall not name but the bar rallied around you and have been very keen that you maintain your anonymity is that what it has felt like to you and if so, why do you think the profession has absolutely no interest in unmasking you? There has been tremendous support from the bar, for which I am eternally grateful. But I think that the main reason is that people generally accept my insistence that beneath the rabbit avatar is a very average criminal hack who leads a deeply uninteresting professional life. Pay no attention to the bunny behind the curtain. I think if I can rudely interrupt and speak yeah. for the entire rest of the legal profession, um, <laughs> I think certainly for my part, oh well, and, and I think this is certainly the case from others that I've spoken to, SB provides a tremendous public service in doing what so many other self-employed people, including me, find it very difficult to do. Because most barristers are self-employed, whistleblowing on the criminal justice system um, is a, a tremendous professional and personal risk. Um, and it's very hard for people whose livelihoods depend on um, loyalty from key clients and from key bodies. Um, and respect from judges and respect from solicitors and respect from police officers is very, very hard for people to do that. So SB is performing a tremendous public service. And I think the bar recognises, um, both in law and in common morality, the absolute importance of protecting whistleblowers who are trying to do good things. SB isn't seeking um, fame or fortune out of what they're doing. Um, they're trying to, to make the criminal justice system better. And I think the bar as a whole is, is profoundly grateful for that. And nobody, uh, wants to expose or, or put in any at any risk the person who's responsible for doing that. I also think there are quite a lot of people who enjoy being thought to be the secret barrister <laughs> and they don't want it revealed that they're not. Although I have to say it's it's very like the Lady Whistledown conversations. Um, I watched all of Bridgerton while I was in bed with Covid Obviously. and you know who is it could it be you could it be this person could it be that person every robing room in the country is still from time to time like that to the point where I had a barrister recently show me um, DMs between her and the secret barrister to prove that it wasn't her and when I made the point that actually she could be DMing herself she pointed out that would be a ridiculously elaborate ruse, but if it's one SB hasn't used yet, I, I recommend it. Unless it was her. God, I'm tying myself in knots. But yeah, so there are there are a lot of people who enjoy dropping hints that maybe they're the secret barrister and, and just don't want to be revealed as as liars. It's a great public service in many ways, then. Really. Exactly, exactly, and we all know barristers need the ego boost. Yes, we do. 
we really do. But the point is a serious one, which is that what has driven SB, speaking on behalf of SB, is to, tr as well as missed myth busting, to try and lift the bar and the justice system out of the dire straits into which they have been sinking for a very long time. And um, as we've covered already, it's been successful in one part because I think there has been a huge public support, which would never have happened without it. But it seems to be falling on the ears, the deaf ears that really should be listening to it. And with throughout in your uh, throughout nothing but the truth, SB is very open about the the great challenges that come from being worn down in that system all the time. And at the end, SB, you finish off with a letter to your younger self. You say in that letter, it is hard. I find myself losing my optimism, but you're still doing it and you're still going. And I realize that may be sort of a question of paying your mortgage, but there are easier ways to do that. So may I ask you what keeps driving you in a system that seems to continue to keep being flogged by those who should know better? I'm a bloody minded, awkward soldier. <laughs> Quite. Harriet, what about you? It's that you've exposed all sorts of the challenges uh, that have come from working at the bar and how difficult it can be to see people's pain every day um, and deal, especially when you, as you have done, have invited uh, people who have not had successful justice. What keeps driving you in the job and what gets you through the difficult parts of it? It's a good question. Um, I think probably, well, certainly like SB, I have times where I think I'm not sure if I can do this anymore. Um, it's it's a really it is a really tough job and we we only see the bits where things have gone terribly wrong um, and where something dreadful has happened and that can really take a huge emotional toll um, so for me I um, I'm on the the well-being committee in chambers and I send incredibly saccharine um, schmaltzy well-being emails to the rest of chambers every Friday afternoon um, encouraging people to take care of their mental health and it's it's something I take very seriously and certainly during tougher cases so I was working on the Manchester Arena inquiry into the into the bomb at the arena in 2017 uh, for last year and most of the year before and throughout that I, I saw a counsellor and um, you know was fully on my on my well-being front foot because I knew that without that I would very likely burn out because the nature of the job can be so distressing and especially when you see the systems that are supposed to protect those people that you're trying so hard to help failing it can be incredibly demoralizing and there are certainly times when I think maybe I need to go and do something else but don't <laughs> I, I don't know what it is that stops me I suspect it is partly also being a bloody minded awkward sod Wow. Um, but I think it's also, I think when you when you recognise unfairness, there are two responses to it. One is um, to, for want of a better phrase, although I don't mean it as cruelly as this will sound, to ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is to try and do something about it. And when I'm not exhausted, um, which still happily is most of the time, I, I'm in the latter camp I would rather try and do something about it and also I find it very difficult to keep my mouth shut I find it very difficult not to get arsy about things um, and like most barristers love the sound of my own voice so win-win. <laughs> Amen well that brings me nicely to the final question which I want to ask you both which um, given what you just said Harriet about the unfairnesses and the failures if you did have both a magic wand and a pot of gold and you could do one thing to change the system I'm afraid just one what would it be where would you focus it 
I think I would start with resources. And that, that sounds farcical, but I think resources feed culture or um, starve culture. And I think if we had a properly resourced justice system, then training would be available, time would be available, resources would be available for the justice system to function properly for women and crucially for all women, um, especially for marginalised women who at the moment are really, really at the bottom of the food chain. So I think I would like to see the opposite of the defund the police movement that we see in the US. Um, I would like to see a properly funded um, set of police forces up and down the country. I'd like to see a properly funded CPS. I'd like to see properly funded open courts um, because I think the will is there. And I think especially for the majority of police officers, the will is there to drive meaningful change. Certainly within the CPS, the will is there. Within the courts, the will is there purely because although, of course, some people are attracted to any of these jobs for bad reasons, certainly I'm sure some people are attracted to being police officers because they get a badge and a weapon and, and power. And I'm sure some people um, get attracted to the criminal courts because they want to sentence people to as long as they possibly can. But I certainly in my experience, the overwhelming majority of people within the criminal justice system are working in it because they want to help people and they want to make things a bit better, as sanctimonious and schmaltzy as that sounds. But the system is being so, so stretched at the moment that it's it's almost impossible even for those people with the best will in the world who are working all the hours of the day and more at tremendous personal cost to try to make it work. It's almost impossible even for those people to do it. So if I had a magic wand, I would um, get us a government that found, you know, 47 billion down the back of the sofa and was able to give us the gold standard criminal justice system that I'm told we once had. And SB, what would you do? I agree with Harriet entirely. And my wish is similar. And I'm doing two things in a single sentence because you can't stop me. Provide legal aid for anybody accused of a criminal offence and ensure that the system is funded so that anybody who is accused of a crime or is a victim of a crime has a trial within six months. Well, that is a very good note to end on. And, you know, if we manifest it, it will come, I'm told. <laughs> But these are the books. They are out now and will give, take you by the hand into the court system and show you the parts that people often don't get to see. But SB to the bunny and Harriet, thank you so much for being my guests. Good night.